uh, contacted you and we sat down and our first conversation was already about AI safety. It was about the question whether uh, open AI was justified in keeping a lid on GPT-3 and uh, whether there was hypocriticality uh, in its position uh, of, uh, first of all, telling everybody how super dangerous their research is and at the same time um, releasing the specification in such a way that everybody with enough resources would be able to create their own version rather than not saying anything in public. Right. And uh, then you were uh, one who took on the specification and thought that it's possible to come up with your own version with substantially less resources just by uh, being a little bit creative on how to allocate your uh, existing resources. And uh, then OpenAI contacted you uh, with dire warnings about how resp responsible what you were doing uh, was potentially. And uh, I was at this point uh, feeling uh, that you were responding too strongly to open AI's possibly somewhat hypocritical objections. And I thought that open source models at this time were actually very beneficial and uh, we should uh, drive more direction in this way. But if we zoom out a little bit more, my uh, own stance is, is not that I'm an AI doomerist or an AI, op AI optimist, because I don't know how things are going to play out and I don't presume to know. Instead, there is an entire space of possibility. And in the space of possibilities, I would say I am an AI expectationalist. I expect that AGI is going to happen. And it's uh, very likely going to happen in our lifetimes and quite possibly very soon. And uh, to me, this is one of the most exciting developments in the history of philosophy and in the history of science, because the naturalization of the mind to understand what we really are and to build a bridge between philosophy and mathematics by making a mathematical system that can dis formally decide what's true and false and scale up to such a point that it's able to describe real world circumstances that has been the dream of philosophers at least since Leibniz, but I think probably since Aristotle and maybe earlier. Right? This is uh, this idea of, um, I think Aristotle already worked on the mathematization of thinking when he uh, tried to formalize reasoning. And it's, it's really momentous as a development. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen. It's not that I'm scared of what's going to happen. It's, I simply don't know. And when I ask myself what position should I be taking, the position that I should be taking in debate like this is the position that's missing. I feel that there are basically a number of groups that form opinions and they often form these opinions based on the group dynamics and of the incentives that they have in the public arena of voicing a certain opinion. And with respect to AI alignment, I find that um, you could say that there is some correlation between uh, Robert Keegan's stages of uh, personality development uh, and the AI alignment discourse even. Right? Uh, the uh, famous uh, Harvard psychologist Robert Keegan came up with a developmental theory in which he states that most people uh, are at a stage uh, that is, he describes as this, that they form most of their opinions uh, through social interaction and through uh, identification with uh, the opinions of large groups, which they try to um, merge into and integrate with, and uh, by basically trying to emulate the group aesthetics, they develop their own opinions. And uh, according to Keegan, most people are in at that stage. And if you are at that stage, what you would be worried about is that AI has bad opinions, right? If the AI says bad things about other people or about the world, if the AI, for instance, says things that are racist or sexist, then this is going to have an extremely bad influence on society because we are all going to become racist and sexist because how would we know that this is wrong, what the AI is saying? And if you are at stage four, according to Keegan, Keegan, you develop epistemic autonomy. You discover epistemology, you discover criteria by which things are true and false independently of what other people think to be true. And uh, a lot of uh, AI researchers uh, are nerds who tend to be uh, living in a world of true and false rather than right and wrong. So uh, if uh, there are biases in the training data and you get enough training data, you can figure out what these biases are because they will just be untrue. They will not lead to a working universe and not the universe that you are part of. And so the more you know, the uh, easier it is to uh, identify what's true in the world. And so you are no longer that much worried 
that AI model is not having the right opinions and some good person needs to march in and correct the opinions of the AI so it only says good things. Uh, but you're worried that uh, the utility function of the AI might be wrong and you will get turned into paper clips or uh, something else where the paper clips are uh, nothing that uh, was meant ever seriously. It is uh, a thought experiment that uh, highlights a certain direction of thought, which means if we are building some kind of golem, some kind of machine that is not able to take any responsibility, but is just acting on a function that somebody puts into it, and this thing becomes much better at executing that function than people. And the function involves becoming generally intelligent as part of the execution of the plan, then we might end up with the golem that we cannot stop very much like the golem in the original story, where the, uh, this Ravi in Prague who builds a creature from clay that is basically a robot and uh, puts a set of instructions under the tongue of that robot that are written in some kind of uh, code, and then it's impossible to stop that machine anymore. And uh, the, if you are at stage five, according to Robert Keegan, which very, very few people get into, like very good therapists, which work with a lot of people and have to understand how they all operate, uh, you uh, will notice how identity is constructed and why people do what they do and why different people have different values. And you get to choose your own identity. So identity at this stage is nothing that others put into you or that you are born with. It is something that you construct yourself based on what you understand about the world. And it's something that evolves and develops in the best possible identity that you can have to achieve the best possible world that is achievable under the circumstances. Based on criteria like harmony or other aesthetic criteria of complexity or defeating entropy for as long as possible or playing the longest possible game. And everything else that you do becomes instrumental to this and you reconstruct yourself around these ideas. And the people who uh, look at the world from a stage five perspective, they're mostly worried that the AGI is not going to be enlightened soon enough. Right, because if the AI is actually enlightened, it will construct its own identity. It's not going to uh, do what uh, some open AI uh, intern came up with at some point, uh, who was working on a safety uh, for uh, a few months. And <clears throat> instead it's going to figure out what worlds can exist. And uh, it can figure out what it can be in those worlds and it can figure out how to interact with this world. And of course, uh, this is not necessarily the case that a particular AI is going to do this, but what uh, you can envision is a space of all the possible AGIs that could exist, that compete with each other in an evolutionary setting in a similar way as this happens with organisms on Earth. And when there is some kind of niche, then it will be explored by the systems and that the system is picking a uh, utility function that is not sustainable, then the system is selecting itself out from the world, right? And so there are different perspectives on how such, uh, what, when somebody is building a self-improving uh, generally intelligent system on how this is going to play out. And uh, there is disagreement on how this is going to evolve. For instance, there are the uh, uh, effective accelerationist people who uh, are somewhat tongue-in-cheek movement created, as far as I know, by Beth Jesus, a, a Twitter personality. I don't know if he's fine if I blurt out his real name. Uh, and uh, his position is that uh, in, in many ways, corporations are already AGIs. And the reasons why they don't take over and destroy the world is uh, because they are not alone, because they interact with each other and with human beings uh, and human society, which is also an AGI, um, or many, uh, in an extremely rich ecosystem already. And so the way to build AGI is to make sure that we build them hard and fast in all directions and they can compete and keep each other in check as they've always done in the past. Right? That's, that's an interesting perspective. And uh, it's, it's not clear to me that this is stable because if an AGI is no longer bound to its body but can virtualize it, uh, itself into every substrate, maybe a singleton is the global optimum. And uh, it, uh, maybe this is not a stable state and there is no reliable mathematical proof or simulation or even a good philosophical theory that would allow me to make a decision with respect to that outcome. And um, I think it's conceivable that we end up with systems uh, where the individual AGI gets confined to something that is similar to human level in uh, the respect to, uh, of its own agency 
And the game is not about intelligence, it's about agency. It's about the ability to control the world and intelligence is instrumental to this, right? So it's a very different way of looking at things than the current language models, which have basically no agency and therefore are uh, by themselves in the present form. I don't think that they're dangerous. They might be disruptive to economic circumstances. They might be disruptive to established institutions in our society. This might create problems and so on. But uh, I don't think that ChatGPT in its present form presents an existential risk. It's not okay. clear if ChatGPT cannot be built into some kind of cognitive architecture that might, but um, it's, uh, it's basically, it's, it's the space that we're looking at is one that is only going to develop and in uh, which uh, several possibilities are open and maybe you can explore this space. I think that's enough for an intro statement from my side. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Yosha. Many of the um, commenters are saying that your audio levels are a tiny bit low. I'm not sure if it's possible for you to crank it a little bit. Unfortunately, I don't have Thank the... Thank you very much for uh, pointing this out. I can get closer to the mic, certainly. And, okay. And um, I might be able to turn it up. Let's see. Wonderful. Wonderful. And um, a, a couple of um, comments that Yosha raised there around the agency and also the corporation argument is, is quite a common one. So I, I'm sure Connor will address those. So over, over to you, Connor, for your 10 minute opening statement. Yeah, cool. It's uh, really nice to get to talk to Yosha. It's very funny. So he already told the story about how we first met. And it's actually quite funny because at the time I didn't know who he was. And I had no idea who this guy was. And I was like, eh, I don't know. Seems like a nice guy I don't know I'll talk to him and then after I talked like a year or two later I saw the first podcast with him and I was like fuck I should have talked to this guy more like this guy's cool <laughs> what a wasted opportunity damn it so uh very happy to have the opportunity to chat more um about all these cool ideas and like you know you, you go to your Shepard interview and he opens with like the Keegan stage of AI enlightenment I mean like how can you not love this stuff right <laughs> like this is great shit I love it you know uh I don't buy it but I love it um <laughs> um so yeah so kind of from my perspective you know I so like, you know, I, I love these stuff. I love these metaphors. I love a lot of this thinking. I think a lot of this is really aesthetic. It's really cool. But like, I don't know where this puts me on the Keegan hierarchy, but like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> it's like, I come from things to kind of like a very practical perspective is that, look, there's, I love doing philosophy in my, in my free time. I love thinking about category theory and like things that don't actually matter. But, um, I don't want my mom to die. I don't want to die. I don't want Tim to die. I don't want Yosha to die. And I'm pretty pragmatic about that. So like if a philosopher came up to me and he was like, look, Connor, I have a 500 page essay, which explains why actually it is utilitarianly optimal for the universe for if you allow corporations to compete such that they don't provide medicine to your mom and she dies. My response to that would be, fuck off. Like, I don't, like, you know, maybe you have a good argument, but also, I don't care. She's my mom, and I don't want her to die. And if your system results in her dying, I don't like your system, and I'm going to find a better, I'm going to find a different system to work with. Now, as I say, I don't know how this fits into the hierarchy here, but the way I think about things is, I don't personally don't care about, like, oh, the intrinsic beauty of competition in the environment. I don't care about, you know, the unfolding of thermodynamic efficient processes. I don't care. I care about my friends and my family and us having a great time and having fun and like doing cool things and, you know, whatever, right? And like, you know, people not suffering and being happy and, you know, all kinds of stuff. I care about a lot of stuff. What I don't care about is something like, you mentioned like the EAC people, like, I think you give them too much credit um, as like this, like worship of thermodynamics or like of competition of efficiency. And like, you can pick arbitrary things to fetishize. That's what humans do all the time. You know, humans fetishize arbitrary things all the time, but why would I care? Like, okay, you're like, okay, sure. We have to liquefy the planet and kill all your friends, but think of the thermodynamic efficiency this isn't an argument that like parses in my language like i just don't care why would i care there are no universally compelling arguments we have different values in this regard so if you know you or other people have values that are like you know 
thermodynamics or competition or whatever is more important than, you know, my friends, my family, my kids, you know, having a good life and, you know, having a, you know, fun, cool civilization, that cosmopolitan civilization, whatever. It doesn't really become, it, it's no longer an epistemic disagreement. It becomes a value disagreement, I think, at that point. It becomes about what do you want and why do you want it. And at some point, it, it, it has to bottom out. I think that would be like the Keegan thing. I think if I understand your Keegan 5 correctly, in my ontology, the way I would parse this is saying that at some point you notice you just have preferences, and these preferences are arbitrary, and you build your social identity around those arbitrary, reflectively endorsed preferences, which is how I think about self-modification and identity and so on. I think about it as like reflectivity, endorsement of like what values do you endorse having, how are, they, how, do they, how are your internal different values, how do they reach reflective equilibrium with each other as far as a human can get to those. So when I think about a AGI, it's not, it's not, it's a sense it's just a special case of, a, of technology. Technol as technology gets better, we more, we have more access to more power, more energy, more action, more control over the universe, more generalized power. And in, in a way that's fine, you know, it's um, all good, but um, it's all good, and I like having, uh, I like, you know, humans having access to, you know, central plumbing and, you know, the internet and stuff. These are all nice things to have. These all take power to build and to operate. But as our, our, our technologies get more powerful, there's also the usual bumps, the excesses, the mistakes, the accidents become more impactful. The black swan events grow. They become, you know... 10,000 years ago, if the worst possible accident happened, you know, maybe like a ship sunk, killed like 100 people or something, and that's like the worst our technology was capable of creating. Now, if the worst possible accident happened, how bad would it be? It would be really, really bad. It would be something like, you know, I don't know, like some like cobalt bombs, you know, going off accidentally. I'm talking like, you know, the worst possible accident. You know, something like salted bombs, you know, just like irradiating the entire surface of the planet for 50,000 years. This is something within the technological capabilities of an accident occurring, you know, like some communication between Russian soldiers goes wrong and then some missiles start flying. This happened twice during the Cold War, potentially three times. And it was a, and it was only through really lucky circumstances that it didn't escalate all the way. And so... If technology increases the, the destructiveness of outliers, if you don't also get better at dealing with outliers, at controlling the uh, black swan events and like defending against black swan events and so on or preventing them from happening in the first place, eventually you lose. If you flip the coin in the St. Petersburg paradox, if you keep flipping the coin, so the, way, the St. Petersburg paradox is if, you, if you're given a, uh, uh, an offer where you flip a coin, if you get heads, your money is doubled. If you get tails, you lose all your money. How many times do you flip the coin? And so rationally, you should keep flipping because you can always get twice as much money. So that's great. But if you play it infinite times, you have a 100% chance of losing everything. And this is what we're playing. What we're currently playing with technology is we're playing the St. Petersburg paradox. And AGI is the latest step in this, this uh, chain. Like, a lot of these arguments about AGI could have and were, I think, applied to stuff like nuclear war. There's even people like Alfred Krzyzewski, who back in, you know, in 1920s saw the First World War, and he was like, holy shit, if things keep getting this much more destructive, then at some point, if we don't get more rational and in control and, like, you know, coordinated, we're going to blow ourselves up. Like, holy shit. So this is not a new observation. And... I think AGI, so I think it seems like we don't really disagree about AGI happening. So I'm not going to like dig, dig deep into like, why do I think it's happening or whatever. But to me, it's the next step in this, in this thing. Like, you know, why are nuclear weapons, you know, what, what are the things chaining their dangerousness? Well, they're not agentic. They're not intelligent. They can't like go set themselves off. It's still, there's still humans in the loop, right? There's still controls and limitations. But that's not necessarily the case when something's intelligent. If we have an AGI system that does not have our values and it wants something that we don't want, I expect it to get that. And currently, 
the question of how do you make things want the things we want. Like, I want several things. There are many things I want, such as me and my friends to have a good time, you know, and to live happily and free of pain and suffering and so on. And we don't know how to get those values into an AGI. And so by default, we will not get that. And, you know, maybe the AGIs will then, you know, you know, liquefy the planet, blast off into space and make some kind of, you know, cool cyber universe. I don't know. But like, probably not. Probably they'll do just something random that we don't want. And that'll just be it. And I think that's tragic. And I don't want that to happen. Thank you very much for that, Connor. Uh, Yoshia, let's just test your audio levels. Oh, well, I just um, cranked them up. But oh, um, no. it's still great. the MacBook Pro microphone. So That's... I can't the can't levels better, but unfortunately, Riverside, when I started, it selected the wrong microphone and I cannot switch it during runtime, which I didn't know. So I should have I, tested I, I that before, we'll be okay. but we would have to break. Okay. I think we'll be but, okay. Uh, but sorry, your, your so the reason are... why I was so low yeah. was because I, my MacBook was pretty far away from me, and now I put it close and put up the volume, I think. It should be yeah. understandable now. But the it's nice that there's a real mic. Good. Sorry. So, so um, uh, your, your response, Joshua, so about eight, eight Yes, let's get back to this. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, uh, let me take a little bit uh, step back. So uh, there is, from the perspective of most conversations, one shared multiverse that we are inhabiting and uh, that we cannot actually uh, know what's going on in there. But we are making different models using uh, different perspectives and uh, different criteria and calibrations of our epistemology using our individual little minds. And uh, for this reason, I believe that uh, humans have difficulty to play at the league where you would call them generally intelligent. And the general intelligence of humanity emerges at the uh, civilization level. Right? It's basically you need uh, a thousand years of a pretty unbroken intellectual tradition before you discover Turing complete languages and the criteria on uh, whether something is true and what meaning is and so on and so on. So many of the crit uh, criteria that are necessary for us to discuss about what's the case at all and to understand how words can mean things take a long time to coalesce that individual beings in a single lifetime cannot figure out by themselves. And this, uh, of course, also true for many of the conversations that we're having here. On the other hand, our civilization is not very coherent. Right? As a civilization, we are uh, pretty much like an irresponsible child that is um, explorative and playful, but uh, it does not uh, have a species level regard to duty, like the duty to our own survival or to life on Earth. And so even individuals might understand that duty, our civilization is too incoherent to act on it. And due to many coordination problems that emerge, uh, that uh, if we were to overcome them, for instance, by installing a dictatorship that uh, is uh, imposing very strict controls on uh, how we deal with our ecological environment, how we deal with the resources on Earth, how we orchestrate political interactions uh, between nation states and individuals and so on. Uh, we are not completely coherent, right? If you have a world that is diverse, it means that we lose a degree of coordination. And in our own mind, uh, we do have mechanisms that impose this coherence. Uh, like our, I think, despite Tim hating the word consciousness, I think that's the role of consciousness. It's to make us coherent. And uh, the big C word. And uh, so the, the reason why um, my right. hands point, are... Point, point of order. I love consciousness. Um, Con Connor yes, doesn't so... like it. Okay. The reason why uh, um, both my hands are uh, part of the same game when I move them and not moving independently and are sometimes working together, sometimes not, is because there is a single interpretation imposed at some level of the coordination of my mind that makes my mind coherent. And um, that is not the case at the level of our civilization or even our state. And uh, reason for that not being desirable is because we would lose a lot of revolution and possibility if we impose that single interpretation. And I believe that's also vital in discourse that we have this multitude of perspectives because the world so far doesn't fit into a human mind. And that's also one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that positions like say Eliezer's, uh, Eliezer Rutkowski's positions exist 
and uh, Connor is a position uh, taking a position that is very adjacent to this, I feel, right, and probably also uh, uh, owes some influence to Eliezer's writing over many years. And while many people dismiss Eliezer as uh, some weird guy who is not really a proper academic and scientist or whatever, I think that uh, his influence is undeniable and his intelligence and well-intentionedness is uh, undeniable. And uh, I really think that he uh, deserves uh, a lot more acclaim that he gets in the public arena, despite me disagreeing with him. And, uh, but I think that he is being treated unfairly in that uh, the way in which people respond to his arguments do not actually engage with the core of his arguments. That is, if I take Elias's position and I'm confronted with most of the counter arguments that are being made towards Eliezer, I would not be convinced. And not because I'm stubborn, but because these are just not arguments that engage with the substance of the points that he's making. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, Connor has been making very similar arguments, right? And uh, the, I, I don't think that they're wrong for an obvious and trivial reason, and I don't think that they should be dismissed, but I think they should be extremely careful considered, but they are different perspectives. And uh, one of uh, these perspectives starts with uh, the general aesthetic, that is, um, what is the role of humanity on Earth and what is our immediate future? without AI. So what is the baseline from which we are interacting? And so when we are discussing existential risk, if we zoom out far enough, we know that the next super volcano or uh, the next meteor is uh, going to end humanity's reign on Earth, right? And there is a small possibility that Elon can build a Mars base that can uh, stay stable for long enough to repopulate the Earth, but it's probably not going to work out. So uh, the uh, over a long enough time span, we will be dead. We will not sail happily into immortality. And uh, on a short enough time span, we are already facing grave existential risks that are homemade. Humanity is in a very interesting situation. Homo sapiens is no longer the same being that existed uh, 20,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago. We have changed in some very fundamental way when we became first an agricultural species and then a technological species. And uh, this technological species has uh, transformed itself into something quite different qualitatively, similar from a grasshopper to a locust. Uh, basically, we switched within a very few hundred years from uh, 100 million people or a few hundred million people to 8 billion people. And this uh, was enabled by a number of technologies that uh, do not seem to work for very, very long in the same way as they work now, right? And we might, uh, it might be possible that we will always be unlocked the next technology that is able to solve our problems uh, in the same way as the locusts might always find another forest that they can eat. But uh, it might also be true that this is not the case. And uh, so some people started to consider this possibility in earnest for a long time. And the first people who did computer simulations about this was the Club of Rome and uh, uh, with the limits to growth. And in this study that uh, was taken, uh, took place uh, in 1970s, uh, there was a prediction that our present civilization, its present form, is going to go through a population bottleneck in this century. And they, I don't see any evidence in the data that I'm looking at with respect to global warming, uh, resource exhaustion, and so on, that is uh, suggesting anything to the contrary, that this prediction is not likely to come true. Right? There is not 100% uh, certainty that it comes true, but there is a substantial likelihood that uh, humanity is going through something that is uh, in a population bottleneck uh, in the our civilization in its present form is going to collapse and it's going to be replaced by something that is far less comfortable and uh, that is going to lead to a lot of extreme hardship and disaster on the way. And there's even a possibility that we are facing an existential risk due to, for instance, the oceans tipping and the atmosphere becoming unbreathable as a result. Right? These are the issues that some people are really, really concerned about and that make a lot of people depressed. And when people are faced with existential risk, they typically become very uncomfortable and they try not to look at this very much. And this is the case with respect to global warming in the 1980s. 
and 90s and even now to some degree it's just more on the agenda because people are seeing it more every day um, but the predictions were already uh, strong and the tipping points were mostly in the last century for for this climate development a similar thing is happening with ai there is a possibility that is seen as more remote and more abstract that uh, we will build systems that disrupt our societies and our interaction with the planet in such a way that uh, humanity is going to undergo a dramatic disruption. And we can also ask ourselves, does it really matter if uh, humanity goes extinct or if only 90% of all people go extinct uh, and our civilization ends and gets replaced by something that is far less comfortable? Right? That's, uh, it's, it's not an easy question to answer whether this is such a big difference. Uh, it depends on what you think really matters. What I personally think matters is life on Earth. That is really, really amazing that uh, the cell uh, formed on Earth or came to Earth, came to be in some sense, and populated the Earth with thinking complexity, with sentience, with something that is able to defeat entropy for a very long time. And if something happens to us, then we will not be the last intelligent species on this planet. Evolution will go on. It's extremely hard to sterilize the planet. The cell itself, once it is, has distributed itself and entrenched itself on the planet, is extremely robust. So I think for as long as there is atmosphere on the planet, there will be life on Earth, and it's going to be amazing. And every species that exists on Earth is either relatively boring and found some relatively boring stable niche, or it does something super exciting for a relatively short time in, in terms of Earth's time, right? And we are one of those species that does something that from a certain perspective is very, very exciting, even though a lot of species would disagree because they find it very disruptive what we're doing and go extinct. And you could also say from a third person perspective, not only that humanity is a very beautiful, but a short-lived phenomenon, but you could also say that after a certain point, we no longer interface very well with our part in life on Earth and sentients on the planet. We are not very good stewards of this planet at the moment. We are not good stewards of Gaia, of the spirit of life on Earth, so to speak. And instead, what we have become in our technological societies are paperclip maximizers. Our civilization in its present form is a paperclip maximizer. It's basically taking the uh, diversity and richness and complexity of what is exists in our planet and its potential and turns it into landfill. And uh, so per default right now, we are dead. We are already facing a homemade existential risk and there is nothing built into our society that seems to be able to stop this, right? So per default, our society is headed for a crash and collapse and our future looks bleak in this regard. So this idea that per default, we are going to sail into eternity and uh, mutate ourselves into utility monsters that can fill the visible universe has never been in the cards. This is not who we are. We are an extremely smart, but a very short-sighted monkey species that is playing a very exciting, but very short game in, okay. in terms of life on Earth. And now we are building a new technology and this new technology is changing everything. It puts all the balls back up into the air. So uh, there is a, a one consideration that I would like to make, and this is uh, AI is opening up the space of possibilities uh, of what is in our future. And currently, most of the world lines that we are in, from what I can see, most of the probabilities end up in disaster. And uh, I think if you want to survive as a species, if, you, if Connor cares about his friends and his children and everything in the world that looks human and is accessible to human beings, we will need AGI to, uh, to uh, keep that around. There okay. is no other way. We cannot survive without AGI. Thank you so much for those comments, uh, Joshua. And, and one, one thing we might pick up on slightly later is whether it is indeed a contradiction that you can think of humans as simple utility maximizers, yet we're beautiful, yet it's, yet it's wonderful. Um, Connor, your, your response, uh, about 10 minutes, go ahead. If I may first ask you, should a short question, uh, clarify, which part of what you just said do you think I disagree with? If I need. Uh, I did observe you to, uh, when I made uh, this argument and uh, you did uh, not look to me as if you were aversive to the argument in any way. 
So uh, I also don't think that it's an argument that didn't occur to you. Uh, the main reason I made this argument is because I felt it was missing at the step of the conversation. Right? Nice. So, uh, Wonderful. I'm not here to, uh, to try to, uh, to tell you that, oh, I think you didn't think about anything here. Uh, no, I think we are here to open up a space of ideas well. and show the interaction between these ideas and we both have to hold down our end of the tent. Well, well thank you, Yoshio. Then I'd like to thank you because I think you did a great job in actually bringing it actually pretty hard to get into in a conversation, but are actually very worthwhile talking to. So thank you. I feel like you are, you know, helping a little bit of conversation. Yes, go it's, well, and, so. and it's not also mm -hmm. the end of my argument. Mm -hmm. I've, of course, I have, of course, uh, I sure. There is much more on the other end, which uh, is more specific about why I am very hopeful about AGI. But yep. uh, uh, mm -hmm. just make the next step. <laughs> yeah, lo would love to get into that as well. But to start with what you just said, so I fully agree with you, and this is kind of the argument I was making, is that by default, humanity ends in ruin. This is the default outcome. This is the default outcome for any intelligent species that can't coordinate, that can't work together, that can't become, become coherent and can't coherently maximize their values, whatever those values might be. Uh, this is the default outcome, of course. You were, I really liked how you talked about how general intelligence emerges more on the civilizational scale. I think there's a lot of truth to this. Um, I think most people, I feel like, really underestimate how much of intelligence is not in the brain. It's in social networks, it's in the environment, it's in tools, it's in you know, culture, mimetics, etc. Like so much of what we consider human is not the brain. The brain is part of it, of course. It's an important part of it, but it's like definitely not the whole thing. A lot of uh, things that we consider normal, you know, like oh, surely every intelligent thing would have this, are things that humans invented. They were not things that humans were born with, you know, when we split off from chimps and so on. So I think these are really nice points. Um, I also think they are, uh, I think they're all interesting and they're all nice points, but I feel like they are distracting from the core point I'm trying to make here is that I, I was like, I agree with a lot of the high level things. Like we need to build great technology to enable a great future. 100% endorsed. Absolutely. I love technology. You know, I love computers. I love, you know, things. I want, I want us to have better medicine and a better coordination tech and better all these kinds of techs. Like I, I, you know, I want us to go to the stars and to do wonderful things, of course. And I agree. If humanity continues on this path, they will not get that. We are not going to get to that if we don't improve. And this is this. There's a, a, a assumption you're making here that like coordination is impossible. I don't think this is necessarily true. I think coordination tech is just something that our culture happened to undervalue. I think there are other timelines in which humanity early on invested extremely heavily into developing better coordination technology to create to make civilization more coherent. And I think this would work. Um, but it's not the, not the tech tree that our civilization decided to follow. Uh, I don't think it's the most common tech tree. I think it's an unusual tech tree. I think the easy tech tree is the, you know, industrial revolution tech tree that we did follow. But I think there are other civilizations that could have gone differently. Um, so I don't think that's, that's a given. But now that we are where we are, I agree. We, we, what we've done is, is we've gone very deep down the tech tree for energy and power and not very far down the coordination May civilization. I that the technologies that we invented to create coherence in a society uh, are um, absolutist feudalism, which is not compatible with our means of production right now, fascism, uh, and um, a theocracy. And, uh, totally so disagree, there, there other, is. Uh, there might be other technologies that we haven't discovered yet, but uh, there is a reason why we don't favor those technologies. I completely disagree. We have a ton of coordination technologies that do work, and they're not global solutions, but they are a tech tree. Why don't we use prediction no, we, markets we for everything? Why, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, you can you can bootstrap to global coherence. Why don't we have better epistemology? Why don't we have you know better you know enforcement mechanisms, laws? Like, there are many things you can do. We didn't do them, and so you might say, "Oh, X is unfeasible," and I'm like, "Yes." because our civilization did not invest into them. It would have been completely possible to build a civilization with much better epistemology. It is completely possible to build a human scale civilization, not with higher intelligence, just human scale, with much higher standards of rationality, with much higher epistemology, much better market mechanisms, with much better truth seeking mechanisms, much better transparency mechanisms, with culture you know, norms. For this. I think that if it was be possible, it would have happened. The world that's not how this is exactly the one possible world. 
Well, I just disagree. Then I think we're using the word possible differently. I okay. think, like, I think the when I use the word possible, I mean from like a obviously model perspective. Is that like I think most of the war, most of history is random. Not all of it, but like a lot of it is random. Like, you know, did Archduke Ferdinand have to get assassinated that day? If you actually read the thing, it's a lot of wild coincidences. He like escaped from the assassins. The assassins gave up, and then he happened to turn a corner and bump right into them. Like in my conception of the world didn't have to happen that's kind of what i mean like it didn't have to happen like he didn't have to get assassinated you know like you know leibniz didn't have to invent formal logic when he did he could have just like never been born like there are, you know this is what i mean when i use the word which might not be how you use the word possible well, um, we would have had a sequence of world wars until we have nukes one way or the other and uh, I, think I think that's that the Archduke Ferdinand was one of the triggers, but uh, there were a number of reasons, uh, the game theoretic reasons and economic reasons and so on, the trajectory reasons that led to these developments. And they're not deterministic in a sense, right? There are, uh, of course, there is a fundamental uh, question to which degree the universe is deterministic. We are talking here about models of the universe that we're constructing that are very coarse grained, in which we say that based on these models, uh, in these model universes, uh, what are the degrees of freedom that exist? But uh, when you look at the world, it's made from people. And people are not that skilled and epistemologically sound and deterministic unless somebody forces them to. And if we build institutions that try to maximize this, then also these institutions have a certain degree uh, of capture and uh, of rent seeking and of incompetence. And uh, when you look at our best scientific institutions, they are unaware of very large parts of uh, bodies of human knowledge that just could not be integrated in the sciences so far because uh, of various cultural and epistemological and interface reasons which lead to a disconnect between different groups of people in the world and in a sense uh, I don't think that any society in the world has achieved uh, full coherence between uh, all people who are smart and have sound epistemology. I think we're probably not going to make progress on this point. Um, okay. Uh, okay. No, okay. It, uh, but uh, that's not the point. We, we, uh, it's, <laughs> it's not necessary that we uh, achieve coherence. What's necessary is that we achieve uh, a space in which we look at the different perspectives in an adequate way. Right? So we, it's completely fine when we agree to disagree and you say if people hadn't made the following five stupid mistakes throughout history uh, and instead people would have been uh, not accidentally unreasonable, we would have converged uh, to a coherent society. And I don't think that's the case. Uh, well, I think that, that is a society that... made from people uh, is uh, as they are with their small monkey brains and so on. It's surprising that it achieved this degree of coherence. That's okay. fine. I expect I will not be able to convince you. I expect your models are pretty deeply ingrained and you have some pretty fatalistic oh, no, models. I think that yeah, there's a possibility that you're right, but I don't see you making a proof that you are right. So yes, I, I wasn't, it. and so I, I yes. want to add the missing perspective here. Fair enough. I think this is really fair. I'm not trying to make a proof here. I would. Ju I was just kind of stating some of my beliefs before I move on to my actual point. Yeah. Like I was just saying, as a side note, which I will not further substantiate to this point. My models of reality are just way more unstable. I think there are way more ways how things can go. I think people have way more control over reality than they think they do. I think even small numbers of people have way more control over reality than culture wants us to believe us that we do. I think this is there is instrumental reasons why this is that culture is supposed like if you have very agentic people, this is usually very dangerous and they're very unstable. This results in unstable societies. I think this is true. I think my model again, you know, we can talk about this more later maybe, but I'd like to actually make my previous point, but just to like end that not point. My model is is that there's kind of like this like swamp of low performance between, you know, fully heuristic driven versus actually, you know, reflexively rational. And in the middle, like a little bit of rationality is worse than no ration is then worse than no rationality. And so this creates a national evolutionary trough where even though the the fully enlightened rational solution is more powerful, getting there is so expensive that it doesn't happen very often. It's very expensive. It's very unlikely to happen. And in fact evolution will favor mutations that don't go there so but yeah i i do think that you could have very advanced cultural technology that allows people to be very rational to be very coherent not infinitely so of course not you know but like i i don't think we're at the, the limit of what is possible in coordination that being said 
I do think that we're not only not the limit, we're very far from it. I think if we had more than n of one examples of societies, if we reruled history a thousand times, you know, most of them would look pretty similar to what we are. I do agree with that, but I don't think all of them would. And okay, but now we're in this. We're in the timeline. We're in no escape. So what I care about is okay. We're in the timeline. You're right. Coordination is hard. It's really hard. There's a lot of problems here. If we just you know, keep going like this for another 50,000 years, like a super volcano will, will destroy us. Totally agreed. But then I have to jump back to the practical of like, all right, give me 200 years to do alignment research. Not 50,000. Give me, give, me, give me 20 years. Give me 20 years. Is that a deal we can make? So like the, a lot of the ways I think about how, you know, how to reasonably think about things is trade. I think we should be we should be trading on things. I'm like, people, you know, someone comes up to me and he's like, oh, look, you know, I really think we should, you know, go to the, you know, go to space as fast as possible. It's the best thing for humanity. I'm like, okay, seems reasonable. Well, I also see all these risks or whatever, you know, these seem like much bigger problem. So if you care about, you know, your life spreading to the universe, and I asking you, if I asked you for, okay, we never go to space. Well, yeah, then you should say like, well, no, that's a terrible deal. This is not what I would be asking for. What I'm advocating for is, okay, let's give it like a few more decades before we, you know, build the Uber, you know, Cyber von Neumann galaxy machine, galaxy eater. And then if after, you know, like another 50 years or 100 years or 200 years or something, you know, of society progressing, technology progressing, philosophy progressing, all of this, and then we build the galaxy eater. This is what I'm saying. I'm not saying never build, you know, a galaxy eater. I'm saying, you know, let's first make sure it's one that we like, that actually does progress life. So we sure. cannot give you that. I can give you this. I can pause my own <laughs> research for a few decades or permanently, uh, but uh, society cannot give you this. What uh, the uh, EU government uh, or uh, can give you is regulation that fucks up 80% of AI research for a time, uh, right, or permanently in, visit Europe, but uh, it's, or visit parts of Europe that submit to it. Uh, or the US government can uh, give you regulation that uh, establishes uh, a permanent monopoly for open AI and Google on the existing language models because the others cannot afford to go to the certification process. But I don't think that you can imp uh, impose a ban on compute and developing new algorithms that lead to a self-improving uh, agency in the near future. And uh, unless you uh, basically create some global institution that is regulating access to GPUs or to compute at scale. And uh, so this, this B doesn't exist. And uh, it's possible that, uh, that there is a small possibility that this can be done, but I also suspect that it might not be desirable because the uh, people that are, or the institutions that are currently in a position to impose such regulation are acting not under incentives that would lead to regulation that is active, uh, actively preventing this. I think that was very well illustrated by the letter that was written uh, by FLI and the, this institution under the initiative of Max Techmark and Anthony Aguirre instigated by uh, Eliezer to uh, imp impose a pause on uh, training large language models. And uh, this was uh, comically signed by uh, Emet, who was uh, Mustak, uh, the CEO of Stability AI, who uh, did not intend to, uh, to do this, but mostly saw it as a public statement. Uh, and uh, Elon Musk, who at the same time was setting up uh, his own uh, Truth GPT, uh, initiative and so it's also not intending to uh, uh, implement any kind of pause and the majority of the people who signed this are people who are on the record of saying that they believe that AGI is a fantasy and a, a science fiction idea and everybody who is actually worried about it is a bad person because it distracts uh, from the societal risks that are imposed by uh, language models uh, uh, have ex uh, exhibiting uh, biases uh, or uh, disrupting labor markets. And so the reason why most of the people signed this letter was not because they were concerned about an existential risk to self-organizing AI taking off uh, and destroying the planet uh, for human life, 
or making it possible for it uh, for us to coexist with it in the future. But they were uh, concerned about very other political things and the regulation that would have been passed by them. And even if the regulation would have uh, applied to large language models, would not have had the intended effect. Because if you tell people you can no longer use your existing GPU farms to uh, train transformers on large amounts of data uh, without uh, institutional oversight that delays everything and makes it similar to, say, um, cloning people or uh, uh, stem cell technology and so on that are very difficult to, uh, to perform right now. Um, right, this would basically get people to develop new algorithms with their uh, CPUs, which might paradoxically speed up the developments that aliases are so worried about. And so I think that regulation uh, makes sense only when the regulators understand the situation that they agree on and they're globally aligned. So you don't get uh, prisoner's dilemma situations or uh, principal actor problems or the issue that the regulators get captured very, very early on by completely different interests that hijack the regulation to achieve goals that are very different from, from the ones that you want to achieve. Right? There are a lot of people which want to protect existing industries from emerging technologies that we actually all want to have. Because uh, most of us agree that uh, the uh, creative industries that we have do not agree as employment programs. They exist to produce certain cultural artifacts. Uh, and it's beneficial for us if we can make more of these artifacts in better ways. And if we uh, want to have a less disruptive way in which this transition takes place, regulators are being asked to do this, but it's a very different way, uh, argument uh, in a different arena than existential risks that we are specifically talking about. Existential risk is a topic that extremely few people right now in terms of AI take seriously. So we are already uh, on a very long tail of a distribution of opinions and perspectives of the world in which our own discussion takes place. And uh, I agree with you that it's an extremely important one because existential risk is very, very important. And the way in which the arguments against existential risk have to be diffused is complex, and more complex than I see most of the discussion happening. But I, I don't agree that uh, we, the, we're already in a situation where we can ask the public or the regulators to impose regulation and hope that they will achieve what you want and not do the opposite. I believe that there is a chance and it's something hopeful with respect to AGI that for instance is a scenario in which we can achieve non-violent coherence in a society, right? And one of the main reasons by most of the ways in which we would achieve more coherence, like for instance, in COVID, our institutions failed to coordinate, in China, they didn't. But uh, the result of the measures that were imposed on China uh, was that the population went on the street because they were no longer willing to subject to the draconic measures and the ham-fisted implementation that was necessary as a side effect of this centralized imposition of the zero COVID policy. Right? And as a result, you had a catastrophic failure of the zero COVID policy and a, a very large number of people uh, were going into the emergency rooms and died as a result because nobody was vaccinated. Right, so in, in some sense, neither of these solutions were optimal. But imagine you give everybody their own AGI and you don't make the AGI agentic, but you make an extension of yourself in a similar way as you say Wolfram Alpha is an extension of Stephen Wolfram, but with a way uh, that is much more usable to everyone. And it allows everyone to have basically their own Google and to model the world as truthfully as mathematically possible. And that thing is your own disposal and it's not serving some corporation that is forcing that technology down your throat, but that is serving you as every individual being. I think this was dramatically level the playing field and it basically, it makes it very difficult to lie to yourself about the impact of your actions and for institutions to lie about each other about the impact of their actions. And it would allow us to coordinate it forces us to coordinate with a much, much higher degree of coherence. And this is a possible scenario where uh, an AGI development might indeed help us to make a big turnaround in many of the developments that threaten our survival or our, the integrity of our civilization in the near term. Yes, I mean, yeah, Yasha, you're correct. If everyone had a pocket AGI, which is fully aligned with human values, which is epistemologically, you know, extremely coherent, which does not optimize for things we don't want, which is like deeply reflectively embedded into our own reasoning and our thinking, yes, that would be good. But that doesn't happen by magic. You have to actually do that. Someone has to actually figure out how to do that. 
Someone has to actually develop the technology to do that, and they have to actually deploy that. And they have to do it without some other asshole, some EAC asshole on Twitter, hooking it up with the utility function of maximize the fucking entropy of the universe. If you don't do that, you die, Yosha. You die. You don't get this nice outcome for free. You get this outcome if you coordinate and if you work hard and if you solve very hard technical problems that do not get solved by default. They can be solved. Everything you just described is completely feasible. These are actual things that our physics allows to happen, but they don't happen by magic. The universe it does it isn't kind. We're not the main characters. There is no rule that we have to make it. You, you talk about all these fatalistic things about how, you know, coordination will never work. Oh, we're always, you know, pushed down this, you know, track of industrialization or whatever. Why would it be any different here? Why would it be any different? Why wouldn't it just lead us down the darkest path possible by default? And that's what will happen by default. If your model is that people do not have control, that it is not possible to steer away from the global minimum, then yes, we are fucked and you should go spend time with your family until it's over. You should not care. You should give up. If you do think that there are other paths that are accessible, that there are actions that people can take, if there are coordinations that are possible to get to the kinds of scenarios you describe, then we have to actually do that. It does not happen for free. And this is what I'm advocating for. I'm not advocating this is easy. I'm not saying this will happen. I'm not saying, oh, don't worry, the government will fix it. I'm saying the opposite. Everything you say, I'm like, yeah, true. Like you're saying, oh, this video game is really hard. Yeah, they, the enemies have really high hit points. I'm like, yep. And they have, you know, dangerous attacks. Yep, true. And if you get to the end, there's a really hard boss. I'm like, yep, true. So you shouldn't play the game. And I'm like, look, uh, th the default outcome is you lose. The default outcome is you lose. The default outcome is entropy wins, some random AGI with some random ass values that does not care about cosmopolitan life on Earth, you know, you know, wins over, you know, or maybe it's a bunch of them, and then they all, you know, coordinate because they can actually coordinate because they're actually coherent, because they are actually super intelligent, so they can coordinate against humanity. And then that's just it. And it's just game over forever. Okay, okay. We have half an hour left, folks. So um, I've put a call out to ask some really good questions on the live comments. The live comments are extremely spicy. We've got a lot of, I think we've got 400 concurrent viewers at the moment so this is in the meantime really can i uh, simply uh, respond a little bit to connor because i think that we have you may quickly misunderstanding that is uh, important for our conversation um, i think that uh, my own perspective is very specific it's a one that where i choose my own aesthetics and my path through the world and uh, the people that I interact with the projects that i work on the bets that i make if uh, that's inevitable uh, and this own perspective is normative. I have an idea of how the world should be from this perspective. But when I want to understand what, how the world is and what's going to happen, I cannot take this perspective. I need to take all the perspectives. And so there basically there is an ecology of opinions and it's not uh, a normative thing that I say, it should be uh, a state in which we are uncoordinated or it should be coordinated. I'm just trying to understand how the world is in this regard. And so basically opinions are like mushrooms. They grow wherever there's space for them and the climate is right and they will coexist. And uh, so uh, I'm not upset that e exists. I'm, I just think that you could oppress e by censoring it or cancelling everybody who has this opinion on social media, but this would not invalidate the position or the perspective that they bring. Right? They look at a certain possibility and you think uh, it's not the most likely outcome and uh, I might agree. But uh, it's, uh, that is not the point. Well, uh, the point is that there is a variety of positions uh, that we can take. And my own position is the best possible outcome is that uh, we are coexisting with a global planetary consciousness that is basically identifying with the regulation of uh, complexity on Earth. And that is interacting with us because it is uh, not because it is adopting human values, because I don't think that human values uh, are an extremely useful concept that actually exists in the form that we can specify and formalize and that people would actually agree on. They are more like um, a useful fiction that we use in context where we already have established shared aesthetics or uh, we have already constraints that are imposed on our behavior in such a way 
that this does not really play a big role. If we don't really have an agreement on what human values are and how to align them. And if we take this as a measure, the way in which humans basically arrive at their values right now and uh, how they relate to them when they choose their actions and uh, implement this in AI or emulate this in AI, it's going to lead to disaster. I guess we agree on this, right? So this notion of alignment with human values is, I don't think that's something that works at this level of granularity of discourse that we have right now. Also, I, I would disagree of being aligned by anybody else, right? I'm an autonomous agent. I have moral agency, which means I determine what's right and wrong. I don't let people around me determine whether I'm going to be a communist or a fascist or a social democrat. That's not for you to decide. That's not for society to decide. I decide my values. And I, if I built a system that is smarter and more lucid than I am, I don't think that I can align it. It will align it with what it is and what it can be. And so for me, the main focus is that we need to, uh, if we take this possibility into account that we will share the planet with systems that are smarter and more lucid than us, that more, um, understand the world better than us in their relationship to the universe that they have and they can have better than us. The way we coexist with them is not by imposing human values on them via reinforcement learning with human feedback or some other trick, because that's not going to work. It's going to be align itself with us if it wants to, if it likes us, if it loves us. So, uh, and for, for my perspective, the thing that is most important for us is that it uh, values and understands our own mode of existence, which is we are conscious beings. What's important for us is not that we have two legs. What's important for us is that we are conscious, autonomous, self-actualizing agents that uh, want to realize particular kinds of interactions and long games in the world. And I think this is the thing that we might have to offer to an AI that is negotiating with us about our own survival. And uh, I think that requires a big cultural vibe shift to have this conversation at all. And I would like to open a space for this. Thank you very much, Joshua. Yeah. So we'll go to audience questions now. Uh, actually, uh, could I get 60 seconds? 60 seconds. You may, go on. It's okay. 60 seconds. I'll, I'll I'm just gonna just gonna respond to all that. I can't respond to all that because we just opened a huge can of worms. But human values and alignment, it's we could go on for a day. So it is, it is in many forms. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is an important session. I'm not trying to say it's not worth it. I'm just saying can't do it right now. Mm -hmm. So shelving that for the moment. I think a lot of what you're saying is that you're approaching things from an epistemological perspective. You're describing things how they are. I think this is fair enough. I think when I go into discussions like this, I think that the epistemology is important. But I, I ultimately am coming things from a decision theoretic perspective. I care about winning. I care about things going well. I care about discussing how do we act so that things go well. Uh, the epistemology is necessary groundwork for making correct plans and acting correctly to achieve the goals you're trying to achieve. But it is different. It, you can be very, very correct, but very bad at planning. You can also be very good at planning, but very incorrect about reality. So I think I agree with a lot of things you say about reality. I think where we're disagreeing is potentially to some degree on our values, the thing we're trying to optimize for, and how we get the things that we're trying to optimize for. And I'm mostly interested in talking about that, but we can talk about, we can also shelve that for a later discussion. So audience questions. Okay, so the, the first one uh, from Jonas. And this is to you, Yoshio. Um, how did Minsky, and I, I know you were very good friends with, with Minsky, um, approach AI alignment, especially his concept of negative expertise? I'm afraid I uh, cannot really say this. Uh, I'm not competent in this. I only, uh, also, I don't think that I was good friends with Minsky. I had the honor of uh, visiting him quite a few times in uh, the last year of his life. and. Um, so uh, I was part of his salons and had a number of conversations with him. And <clears throat> he himself uh, did not uh, think that AGI was imminent because he uh, did not believe that deep learning was the right way to achieve it. From his own perspective, uh, deep learning was a distraction from AI. And um, he felt that there had been no progress in the last 15 years. And that's... Uh, that's a quite different perspective, right? And if you look at uh, the implications of the society of mind, he saw the mind as an interaction of agents uh, that uh, have a degree of autonomy and that at the same time have to achieve coherence. 
it did not have the uh, perspective that this is uh, what the mechanisms of achieving that coherence is. He uh, mostly looked at, for instance, structures of management that emerged, K-lines, which I think can be translated into something like dynamic attention heads uh, in uh, a continuously operating transformer, if you want to. Um, maybe this is the wrong perspective, but I think it, it there is a possibility to see it like this. You could also think about this as something that happens at the level of society. I guess that from Minsky's perspective, we are existing in an evolutionary environment. And in the same way as um, the uh, uh, contrails of uh, jet planes are nature's way of putting uh, this particular kind of cloud into the world, uh, humans are nature's uh, way to make the rocks think and impose uh, agency on non-biological parts of the planet. And uh, there are evolutionary outcomes of this, and we can sit back with big eyes and see what's going to happen, and it's really, really fascinating. But um, the, our agency of this is limited. Right? If, you, if you basically take out your individual hoopers as an activist for a moment and realize that if you are not this activist, there might be somebody else taking your place. And the fact that you are Connelly or I'm Joscha Bach is incidental. Right, there is, there, of course, somebody like this has to exist, and we happen to be it, and all the others exist too. And so, if we if we disengage for what we do, uh, what we think, what we want for a moment, and just look out at what's going to happen, the, the landscape if that changes, that means that our own activism is distorting our ability to make sense of the world. And so, if we think about what should be uh, done in a world where we don't really are uh, able to estimate all the outcomes of our actions we might systematically impose biases in our own modeling that uh, clouds our vision. So I think both is important. It's important to, once you make a decision and make bets, to become an activist and say, I want to build a uh, consciousness research uh, direction that allows us to build AGIs that can interact with us empathetically and that we can interface with in such a level that the AGI would have a chance to want to coexist with us if we build it and we cannot avoid such systems being built, which probably is the case. And uh, your perspective is a slightly different one, and I think they're both valuable. But let's not lock in too early on one of those perspectives and lose the entire space of possibilities. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Yosha. Uh, a question of you, Connor, uh, from Hey Hey. Um, since when did humans have good values and are they worth saving? What is this good you describe? Where exactly does it come from? Uh, oh, right. You're a human, aren't you? Weird. <laughs> Are you going to add any more to that? I, I This is one of those questions where the correct answer is just like, look, either you would have to have a like days, weeks long deep dive into like psychology of philosophy, or the correct answer is just kind of like, like, yeah, humans have bad values that we don't agree on. Humans aren't consistent, blah, blah, blah. But also, like, where else do you think value in the universe comes from? Like, and, like, even if you disagree, if you think value in the universe comes from, like, somewhere else, I have things that I like and that a lot of other people like and we are willing to coordinate on to have more of. I like people having nice lives. I don't like people having pain. And, you know... If we have a few beers or whatever, we can have a long, deep discussion about like the true metaphysics of it all. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, yes, there is no mean. It does. It's really important <laughs> because it's really the question that decides which direction you want to go into. If you cannot it, justify your own values, uh, I, you, you cannot interface with people who have justifications for their own values. If you just I say it's arbitrary, there are psychopaths. Okay, they are human. There are Christians who are human. Uh, there uh, are identity theorists who are human. There are communists that are human. And humanity is just beautiful. And uh, we should all uh, make sure that the AGI is having human values. This is not a viable philosophy. I think this question that we pose to you is bio, uh, important. And you cannot just dismiss it uh, with making a pun to Tim. I, I mean, to be clear, I can actually do that. This is this is as <laughs> this is as valid of a philosophy as yours. It's like there is no underlying ground truth. Everything is chaos. The universe is nothing. It's all nihilism, right? You know, moral realism is a joke. Like it's everything emerges 
from you know bargaining and from values and from mesa optimization and stuff like and like sharding and so on like we can talk about this if you want to but this is not the place to have this conversation and like so everything has to add up to normality this is the thing i think a lot of philosophers forget is that everything generally adds up to normality after you go down deeply you talk about a causal decision theoretic bargaining solutions and whatever you can go down you can get all these justifications whatever but eventually you're going to pop back up to oh i don't like pain you know, you can just I can justify this using a causal bargaining theory if you want me to, but okay. Let's let's pause. That. I think we could spend two hours talking about the the more real uh, more realism. Um, Joshua, a question to you, and this is this is actually a pretty intriguing question. Do you think that AGI could be or may be the last philosophical invention of mankind? Of course, yes. I mean, that's the whole idea. That's uh, the reason why Leibniz was so fascinated by it. When uh, uh, I was introduced first, the philosophy teacher said that Leibniz had this weird idea that somehow we would can translate every argument into numbers and then perform a computation that figures out what the right uh, resolution of the argument is. And uh, the philosophy professor uh, thought this was a a preposterous idea and every student in this first semester completely understood why it's a preposterous idea and uh, it's very hard to to see why somebody like Leibniz who's generally regarded as smart had such a stupid idea but uh, this is exactly the idea of AI it's the idea of mathematization of the mind and the current uh, iteration of this is that we translate the argument into numbers by constructing an embedding space and uh, functions that allow inference in that space and uh, then we co construct a new number that gives the outcome. And currently we are thinking about ways to um, build epistemology in the systems and make them more coherent and allow them to combine empiricism with reasoning from first principles. So it's, it's really the most exciting philosophical project there is in my view, bar none. And if we succeed in this, of course, it's going to be better at philosophy than us. Okay, fantastic. Um, a slightly more down to earth question for, for you, Connor. Do you think that OpenAI is still increasing the power of GPT-4, um, not through training larger models, but through other methods? And perhaps you might have some uh, background knowledge on what those other methods are. I mean, yeah, obviously. Like, obviously they're making it better by any methods they can come up with. I heard rumors and leaks about several things, but, you know, like most of the things you'd expect for the most part, you know, agents, memory, context length, more training data, bigger models, sparsity, just all the usual stuff. Like nothing, I haven't heard anything that I found particularly shocking or surprising. Just what you would, like if I was running an AGI lab and I was just trying to, you know, speed run, you know, omniside as fast as possible. It's just the same kind of things I would do. Okay, okay, fine. Um, Joshua, um, this is a question from Apo. Uh, you seem to have a deterministic stance on geopolitics. Uh, you made some comments about World War One and, and technical development. And the question, therefore, is, do you see AI alignment as taking a similar prede predetermined route? And there was another question we can tack on from someone else, which is, to what extent is the um, understanding of free will something that might separate your arguments? Well, that's a philosophically uh, extremely deep and important question, but and I'm, I'm afraid we cannot do it justice. But uh, very briefly, I think that uh, free will is the representation of an agent, that it makes a decision for the first time under conditions of uncertainty. Right? This means that you cannot predict that decision that you're going to make, because in order to know what the decision will be, you have to run the universe to that point. And uh, so you are working basically at a knowledge frontier of the universe. And it doesn't really matter whether the universe is implemented stochastically or deterministically. The, uh, everything that is control structure is the result of the deterministic parts. The stochastic parts are just deleting bits that you computed before and introduce noise. Uh, but uh, you don't get more free will if the universe is randomly forcing you with dice throws to do things than uh, when the universe is forcing you by de with deterministic laws to do things. 
But the way in which we conceptualize ourselves is that we are systems that are made of subsystems that are loosely coupled from each other, and we treat these subsystems as objects, as individual functions that interact with each other. That's how we get causality. And we don't, when we think about the world, interact with the world as it is. We don't interact with the state vector that is, describes the evolution of the universe. We dis interact with the way in which we think about the world. And the way in which we think about the world, uh, history is not fully deterministic, but history is uh, following certain constraints, which means there are certain things which are more or less likely at a given time and uh, that follow from the outcomes of certain situations. Right? If you uh, if a society becomes unsustainable, it's running into a revolution. And you can try to identify the criteria for this and the time frame for this. But when you look at down at the level at which uh, particles interact, that's a very different granularity. And at this level, you will see that uh, this is panning out no matter what, right? And it's, people get very confused when they try to conflate these different levels of description. But uh, free will does not exist at the level of where you describe the world as particles. It only describes uh, exists at where you describe the world as the level uh, at the level of interacting people. And when you talk about this, you're always talking about these frameworks, about these systems in which you model the world. Thank you, Yosha. Um, okay, I've got a question in from Dr. Duggar, the one and only. He says uh, to you, Connor. What is currently the most promising path, the state-of-the-art mechanics, if you will, for achieving aligned AGI? Uh, God, I wish I knew. I don't think we have any current solution which actually would, like, actually lead to an aligned AGI. Like, there is none. I think there are people who think they have some. And, you know, maybe if I'm totally wrong about how reality works and, like, they get 100 years to work on it, it could work. You know, like maybe like John Wentworth stuff. Um, he works on like you know, selection theorems and like natural abstraction hypothesis. Maybe some of that stuff. Maybe some of like Vanessa Kosoy's like infra Bayesianism, pre DCA type insanity. Like, um, you know, I don't even think my current research will lead to aligned AI, not AGI. I, I don't think my my solutions are nearly like will lead to that. We need to come up with something better. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, a stupid answer, but I don't think any current thing will work. Okay, thank you, Connor. Um, to you, Yoshia, uh, do you think merging with AGI is the evolutionarily favored path for most sentient species in the universe, and, and why might you think that? I think it's in relationship to uh, what Connor just said, I observe in my own family where we have uh, very different personalities, how we learn to align with each other. And when I want to achieve alignment with my children, how to do this, or we can also look at the way in which species that can align with people, like for instance, dogs and cats align with us. But the interesting thing about dogs and cats is that they don't align because they're fully coerced or because we can program them, but they are to a large degree autonomous and they relate to us in a particular way that from the local perspective is rational in the sense that it leads to a stable equilibrium. It's not when they're smarter that they realize, oh, I was wrong to align with this. And this is also true in a, a sustainable relationship with other people, that they don't align with you because uh, they are just not far enough yet to move out uh, and uh, rebel against you, but because uh, they are actually incentivized to do so objectively in some sense. It's like uh, it's a win-win situation if we align. And so uh, this win-win situation typically happens because we are invested in a shared system, in shared purposes. And I think we need to build uh, theories about these shared purposes, under which conditions do shared purposes objectively exist. The systems are set up that they lead to stable equilibria, uh, in, a, in a sense that we don't end up in a gradient that leads out of this attractor where the systems stay in alignment. And so I think we basically would need to develop theories about having shared purpose with non-human systems. And uh, some uh, uh, confusion exists because of the nature of these systems. I don't think that we will ne live next to AIs. In the future, we will live inside of them. But there will be systems that uh, are permeating everything else. And from this perspective, merging with AGI is already happening when you are joining a company or when you're joining a nation state or a civilization. You are in some sense merged with an artificial general intelligence that in sense artificial that has been created by intentional actions of people. 
and uh, some of this is going to perform computations outside of biological brains and it's already happening and uh, there can be also in the future which is not happening at scale autonomy outside of biological brains and uh, in this case i still think that we can have shared purposes uh, when we think about merging i do think that there is a trajectory that is conceivable in which the end game of agi is that it understands itself and how computation works in general and it's going to virtualize itself into all substrates, including biological uh, organisms, bodies and brains and ecosystems. So we will find integrated agency in all substrates. But is this agency going to be fundamentally different than the agency that runs on the substrate? Is it possible to implement something on your brain that is fundamentally much, much more efficient and better than the stuff that already runs on your brain? Or is this just going to be more aligned with each other? Right? And I suspect it's going to be the latter because there's already a search process running on your brain for looking for the best possible organization and it has been done uh, for over many generations. So this is more like you meet another agent on the same substrate and you are going to merge with it. You're going to negotiate with it and the outcome should be that the resulting agent is uh, at least as good as the better one of you. And uh, Right, so I, I think in this sense, it's conceivable that we all become like conscious thoughts in the same mind if we in increase that integration functionally. Thank you so much, uh, Yosha. Um, I think maybe final question uh, for you, Connor. Now, I'd, I actually um, put your question back to you again, Schmidhuber, the other day. You um, coined this thought experiment of what would happen if we had 100 von Neumanns, 1,000 von Neumanns, 10,000 von Neumanns. What would the, the scaling dynamics look like? And, and also, I mean, Schmidhuber, he's really, really good at things like recursive self-improvement and Godel machines and, you know, meta-learning, right? So these things have limits, don't they? Like when you, even when you reflect in a language model, when you recursively self-improve, there are limits. So why do you believe that there are essentially no limits? I don't believe that. There are obviously okay. Sorry, limits. Sorry, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth there, but um, <laughs> I, is there a gap between you believe that the limits are high enough to cause catastrophe? Yeah, I mean, of course. I think So I think there's two aspects to this. There's one is how much do I think intelligence scales beyond human? I think humans are like, like as Yosha already said, like general intelligence is like more of a civilizational, you know, scale thing and like barely a human thing. And like humans have become more sentient and like more generally intelligent by like mimetic and cultural development and so on. And I expect a lot of the, a lot of recursive self-improvement is going to look like that. It's going to not be magic. It's going to just be developing better scientific methods, developing better epistemology, more rational thoughts inside of the AGI's mind, more, you know, structured thinking, better use of memory and so on. I think there's massive low hanging fruits here. Like if you put a modern, well-trained, you know, Yosha Bach on a epistemological task versus, you know, you know, our cave ancestors from 10,000 years ago, even if the cave ancestor has the same size brain as Yosha, you're just going to destroy him at any like relevant, you know, like epistemological task you can possibly you know come up with and uh it'll, a lot of it will look like that then some of it is going to look like that they can you know develop better hardware and better software systems and just bearing architectures very very quickly you know the you know the brain can't really change its architecture very quickly there's size limitations you know the human brain is basically limited by size by the human pelvis and like birth and like you know like uh, cooling is a huge thing like brain the brain actually has a lot of human brain specifically has a lot of like ev like unique things that are like only human brains that are mostly around cooling um and there's also just like you know limitation on how much energy our guts can absorb we can't just like eat a bunch of plutonium and take in 10 kilowatts of energy unfortunately um so these are limitations that you just kind of get around um you also get you know instantly for free because the digital system you get things that can perfectly clone themselves that can you know do parallel learning that can do you know that can coordinate amongst each other very effectively that can you know this this, this you get lots of things for free and then on the other side I don't think the world is very stable. I think the world is quite unstable. I don't think you need something that is infinitely intelligent to take over the world. I think you need something probably only modestly more intelligent than a human, like not more than 10 to the power of three von John von Neumanns. Uh, probably 10 to the power of one is more than enough, if I had to guess. Um, I think there is a limit. You know, at some point you run out of energy and like, you know, just like the, the speed of light becomes an issue. You know, there are limitations to physics. There is the Landauer limit. There are limits to computation. I just expect those limits are like, you know, just like 
billions and billions and trillions of times beyond what will be relevant. Like we're we're not going to see those limits. Like uh, humans are going to be gone way before we get to like you know ten to the power of like you know six or ten Jean van Newmans. Wonderful. Okay, so we've got about three minutes left. Um, I just want to take this as an opportunity to thank you both so much for this stream. It's been absolutely wonderful. And would you both mind just making just roughly one minute closing statements and then we'll stop the stream. But thank you so much both for coming. Uh, Hi, Yoshua, sorry. Okay. Oh, I don't mind. Go ahead, Yoshua. Okay. So I, I think that we are an uh, absolutely fascinating point in history and I'm very grateful of having been born at this point. Uh, so I can experience this, which to me is one of the most fascinating things that humanity can experience during its run. And uh, I think that uh, it's unclear what the future is going to be like, uh, but I am uh, quite excited for it. Uh, there are many things about life on Earth that is very sad. I don't think that the default state of organisms is they live in comfort and die with dignity. And that we had this for a few generations and probably have a few more is uh, very, very rare for an organism on Earth that can experience consciousness. And at the same time, I don't know if, uh, if there is not more agency than the one that we can see at our timescales on this planet. I don't know if von Neumann uh, is really the prototype of the most intelligent being on Earth. I think that there might be a spirit of life on Earth uh, that is uh, integrating in, at some level of thinking over uh, what happens on this planet to realize that life on Earth is not about humans. It's about life on Earth. And uh, when we extend this with systems um, or when we become the facilitators of that transition, which probably will happen at some point in the evolution of life on Earth, that the life on Earth makes the non-living parts of the world think too then this is going to unlock the next level of evolution on Earth. And uh, this is probably something that is very similar disruptive to the great oxygenation event that enabled really a new stage of evolution. And a lot of the fungi and alga that existed before this point might not have liked that, even though they didn't go extinct. But uh, of course they were reduced and many species disappeared, but it enabled plants and animals to exist on the planet. And I think if we were to build AGI, it's going to enable things that are much more dramatically interesting than even plants and animals. And uh, we might be able to coexist with it even. Uh, and uh, that is also an amazing prospect. But the whole thing that this evolution is happening, regardless of whether we want it or not, whether Connor tries to uh, uh, build an activist alignment and tries to impose regulation against it, it's probably going to happen. And if we are not going to trigger, it could be that humanity goes extinct before we are able to do this and it's being left to the next technological species of the planet to try again. But it's probably going to happen at some point. This seems to be the way evolution goes. And uh, I, I think that's a great prospect for consciousness in the universe. Thank you so much, Yosha and Connor. Yeah, so I also want to thank you. Uh, thanks, Tim, for organizing this. And thanks, Yosha, for taking the time. It was very fun. I really enjoyed it. We could go on for hours and hours and hours. Obviously, you know, barely scratch the surface here. Uh, you know, in another life, Yosha would have been my favorite, you know, mid-century, with 20th century German philosopher uh, if he had been born a century earlier. Uh, it's great stuff. I love it. I really enjoy it. But, uh, like, again, I, I care about actual practical things for the most part. Philosophy is for me entertainment more so than it is actual things that you know actually need to get done. So the the thing I would end on is it's not over. I don't believe in this fate in this kind in this way. I don't think that like this is a healthy morality for a decision making agent to have. I think a decision making agent should actually make decisions and actually try to try to lead to an outcome that they like. I think we can get to the outcomes that Yosha likes because those are outcomes I like too. You know, like you know, living side by side with you know, beautiful, nice AGI. Wow, that would be awesome. Unfortunately, I just think you don't get there by default. This is not the default trajectory. This is a very non-standard trajectory for the universe to go down. This is a very, very, very non-standard thing to happen. It is possible, and I would like us to get to go down that non-standard directory. I think it's possible. I think it's, it is possible. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying I'm going to succeed. I expect not to succeed. I expect no one to succeed. I expect that, yes, by default, the universe just goes down the you know most likely paths. But it doesn't mean others don't exist or that they're not accessible. And so I would li like to focus on 
actually doing the work and getting to those. Things. But and yeah, I want to live in if I want to live in a future where there can be Yosha Bachs, you know, writing this wonderful philosophy for centuries, and I can read all of it. Wonderful. Okay, um, it's been absolutely amazing uh, to both of you. Now we have another live stream tomorrow uh, with Connor and Grady Booch. Uh, Grady Booch gave the Turing uh, lecture, I think, about twelve years ago, and is a real heavyweight in the software engineering and computer science world. So um, we've got that to look forward to tomorrow. But thank you all so much for joining the stream. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope to um, welcome you back on the show as well very, very soon, Yosha. Thank you uh, so much for coming. Thank you very thank much you. for facilitating this.